welcome to Birkbeck, University of London, and to Business Week, which is our annual showcase of research in the School of Business, Economics and Informatics here at Birkbeck. And each day is devoted to one of the departments within the school, and each day culminates with a uh, keynote lecture. Tonight, I'm delighted to introduce to you to present the Ronald Tress Memorial Lecture, Jeff Mulgan. Jeff is uh, Chief Executive in Nesta, and Nesta combines investment in early stage companies and grant programs ranging in domain from health to education to the arts. From 2004 to 2011, Jeff was Chief Executive of the Young Foundation, and prior to that, he had various roles in UK government including Director of the Government Strategy Unit and Head of Policy in the Prime Minister's Office. He was Founder and Director of Think Tank Demos and is currently Chair of the Studio Schools Trust. So I'm delighted that Jeff will deliver the Ronald Tress Memorial Lecture and I will hand over to him straight away. Jeff. Well, thanks very much. Good evening, and uh, thank you for giving up on a beautiful, warm summer's evening outside to be in here, uh, and uh, giving up on the pleasures of studying the fine detail of the spending review until uh, <laughs> later. Um, <coughs> uh, I was very glad to get this invitation. What you probably didn't realise in inviting me is I was actually a student. I've been a student here at Birkbeck, uh, and quite a few years ago did a course, an evening course here on econometrics, uh, which I think was about the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> I don't know if any of you are econometrics lecturers. They were very uh, good, very tough, and left me with a lifelong but grounded scepticism of all economic <laughs> forecasting, uh, but also an admiration of statistics. Uh, and a little sort of marketing plug um, is that exactly this time last week, I was launching uh, something we had helped develop at Nesta with Ben Goldacre, uh, uh, an online tool called Randomize Me, which helps anyone do their own randomized control trial. So if any of you have spent your entire life wanting to do randomized control trials, which probably isn't most people, uh, you can now go online and construct a trial of pretty much anything, and it takes you through in a very structured way how to get the right sample size, design, etc. So anyway, uh, completely irrelevant to this evening's topic, but uh, so it probably in part happened because of my um, course here. Uh, I have a various other connections with Birkbeck, including the fact that I worked for many years alongside Michael Young, who was at one time president uh, of Birkbeck. And slightly unusually, I think as a president here, thought he had to become a student as well in order to be a good president, and did actually take courses and almost certainly unnerved lecturers by uh, having the president sitting at the back of the class. But it's not a bad thing to do if you are in any position of leadership to actually put yourself in the position of using the services uh, you're um, engaged in, and sadly it is still all too rare for bosses to do that, one of the reasons I'm a lover of the TV programme Undercover Boss, which is one of the UK's more intriguing exports to the world. Um, the last time I was in this vicinity was a few months ago in a, a building just over there in a room almost identical to this with an organisation called Students for Happiness, uh, which um, in the middle of the session had the entire audience standing up with their eyes closed swaying. Uh, I will not get you doing that. Oh, I think not, anyway. <laughs> but it was, I don't know if you were there, it was a rather wonderful um, a a occasion and very much in the spirit of uh, well-being and different kinds of working life. What I'm going to talk about this evening is really essentially about where we go with business, where we go with the economy, what's gone wrong and what can be put right as our economies across the Western world continue to bump along in what now looks like a long crisis, a long, slow crisis with not that much light at the end of the tunnel. 
I'm going to start not with statistics or um, analysis of Mervyn King's valedictory remarks, but rather by asking you to think about emotion. And I think, again, because of the title of uh, this program, I've got some license to do so. And I want you to reflect on how you felt in two sets of experiences. And these are all experiences of being a buyer, buying things. And all of you will have bought in your lives probably thousands, maybe tens of thousands of things, ranging from houses to cars to shirts and dresses to sandwiches and so on. Reflect, first of all, on the times when you came away from a purchase feeling good, feeling that you'd got something which was a bargain, really valuable, something which would really uh, enhance your life, uh, as you opened up perhaps the Amazon uh, parcel uh, or walked out of the shop, whatever it may be. So reflect just for a second on what, what that feels like. And then reflect for a minute on when you've been involved in buying something and you felt the opposite. You've arrived for your holiday on what you thought would be a beautiful you know, paradise island and it turns out it's a building site and the rooms aren't completed. You buy a car and it breaks down, you know, um, uh, after uh, five minutes. Um, or, um, you know, you buy a, a piece of clothing and it falls apart. We've all experienced that being sold, you know, a lemon, a dud. And, again, reflect for a moment on what that feels like. My guess is, for the latter, you feel humiliation, resentment. And for the former, you feel both a sense of, of, of pride and that the world is good. Now, the reason I, I mention these two emotions is because I think they are very deep in our nature. They essentially draw on, on the one hand, our being as humans, which values reciprocity. Reciprocal exchange with other people is what makes societies, economies uh, work. Uh, and we appreciate reciprocity of every kind. And the second kind of exchange we feel is predatory, exploitative, and again, deep in our nature, is the ability to spot and to resent predatory behavior. Absolutely crucial to be able to do so in perhaps the environments where humans were, uh, were, were formed. And these two emotions are, to say, everyday ones for all of us. But the reason I mention them is I think they are key to understanding the nature of a modern market economy, key to understanding what can go wrong with it, key to understanding the politics of business, and also, I will argue, key to understanding how we get out of the current crisis we are in. And yet, those two emotions are almost completely absent from the vast majority of books about economics and business and yet I think are a pretty important starting point. What they lead to, and in particular, are, uh, is the strange dynamic we have at the moment of capitalism and of the place of business. On the one hand, capitalism won its battles against its great enemies in the last century, communism, state socialism, uh, and so on. And to that extent, capitalism has spread across the world, China, India, South America, uh, you name it. And no one at the moment is offering a fully formed alternative economic system to capitalism. I suspect here you do not teach non-capitalist economics. But maybe that's an interesting question we can come on to later. Uh, in a way you might have done 30 or 40 years ago. And yet, on the other hand, all the other things which have spread across the world, like democracy, the rule of law, and science are much less controversial than capitalism. There are anti-capitalist political parties and movements in Britain or America or Germany in the way there aren't now anti-democratic ones. And the reasons have to do with what I described, this underlying ambiguity we have about market exchanges and business and the sense that it sometimes can be good for us, reciprocal, and sometimes can be predatory and open any newspaper any day of the week and you'll see the latest controversies, fair taxation for Google or Starbucks, bankers' bonuses and so on. 
those all play because they essentially tap into that second set of emotions. Those emotions we feel of being ripped off, exploited, taken advantage of. And I believe this duality is actually quite deep in the nature of markets because if you are an entrepreneur, if you run a business, to some extent you have a choice of two types of strategy. You can attempt to create genuine value for other people, to delight them with a new product or a service which enhances their lives. Or you can try to extract money from them and not give very much back. You can aim at asymmetric exchanges. This is not a new insight at all. Indeed, this was written about at length by Adam Smith, the founder of modern economics, though it's part of his writings which are slightly forgotten often by people who claim to be followers of him. So for Smith, it was absolutely critical to understand in any economy the difference between three categories of income. One category was wages. A second was profit, profit which came from fair and reciprocal exchange. And his third category was rent. And rent was essentially predatory, exploitative, asymmetrical taking of money uh, from customers in an unbalanced way. A way which breached the fundamental principle of every moral system around the world, the golden rule, which says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And to go back to your feelings about shopping, buying houses, cars, dresses, or whatever, in the first case, when they're good, you feel you, that exchange is one which is compatible with the golden rule. The seller is doing unto you as you would, you would do unto them. And in the latter cases, the bad cases, it breaches the golden rule. Very simple. Uh, and this is where I think economics and ethics completely link uh, together. Now, in, um, in Adam Smith's account, it became really important to watch out for monopolies, rent-seeking behaviours of all kinds. And I think one of the, th the aspects of our modern economy is that if you look at almost any sector, you will see a combination of some businesses doing very genuinely creative, useful things, creating value for others, but also some predatory, exploitative behaviours. So products like statins or iPads and I would say driverless cars are pretty good examples of the, you know, the creative capacity of a business to serve. And other things like Terminator um, seeds, uh, credit default swaps, uh, and many other examples are, are, are the opposite. They are essentially tools for extracting value from people and not giving very much back. If you ask, why is it the case that in cities like Washington and Brussels, there are more lobbyists, often than people working in the institutions of democracy, the reason is they are paid usually by the predatory parts of the economy, where the returns to be gained from lobbying are greater than the returns to be gained from producing a new good, a new service, which actually delivers value for people. And in the US in particular, the vast quantity of legislation created by Congress is in large part inflated by the addition of uh, rent-seeking uh, 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 um, uh, um, amendments to laws put in to service, again, the predatory parts of industries in energy, pharmaceuticals, finance, uh, and so on. And I believe this is, let's say, key to understanding the dynamics of business and its culture, and it's very striking in popular culture how the predatory view of business repeatedly comes to the fore. Uh, I imagine a fair proportion of you have seen the film Avatar. Be fair to say, I mean Avatar by um, what's the name, James uh, Cameron, Cameron uh, is almost a, a pure description of a predatory corporate capitalism which destroys people, destroys nature, uh, and, uh, and is uh, antithetical to their values. And the fact that a film like that sort of works in the way it does subconsciously and at a conscious level, again, is a symptom of the uh, uneasy position of the market economy and capitalism because of these predatory behaviours. Now, I also believe that this imbalance is critical to understanding the crisis we are in 
and have still not come out of. And in a nutshell, I would argue that in the 2000s, certainly in the US and UK and to a degree in other countries, the balance between the creative and the predatory sides of our market economy was, was broken. Again, the returns to predatory business activities rose relative to the returns from creative activities. The fact that by the middle of the last decade, 40% of corporate profits in the US came from finance was a symptom of a system which had become profoundly unbalanced. There is no plausible economy in which one input, finance, should be extracting quite so much um, value. Um, there's been a lot of analysis of the imbalances, uh, the ways in which risk became uh, out of control, and the since the capturing of upside returns and risks and the lack of, cap lack, lack of responsibility for downside. Much less attention has been paid to the other side of the coin, which was the squeezing of investment in innovation, the squeezing of investment in the creative side of the economy. But um, at Nesta, we've, we've done a lot of analysis of what happened to patterns of investment during that same period. And it's very clear in the UK that businesses were prioritizing either the hoarding of cash or investment in buildings over investment in new products and services. In the US, even many of the leading technology companies were prioritizing share buybacks, again, rather than investment in new products and services. And if you look back through history, it's clear this is actually a repeated pattern, that there are periods when economies get unbalanced in that respect and, say, the returns to predatory behavior grow relative to uh, creative ones. And often what happens is laissez-faire policies are introduced in order to free entrepreneurial energy and spirits, and they do do that, but at the same time they actually create more space, more scope for predatory exploitative behaviors as well, and those then tend to drive the crisis uh, and, uh, and business models and activities which extract value from the real economy rather than uh, creating it. Now, all of this, <coughs> I think, matters because getting the diagnosis of what went wrong is fairly self-evidently important in terms of understanding what to do about it. And I think we're in a, we're in a very odd position at the moment. In many respects, UK business is doing quite, quite well. Profits are okay, but our overall economy is still essentially flatlining. Real wages are far uh, below what, not only what they could have been if we hadn't had a downturn, but even what they were four or five years ago. And there isn't much sign of strong and sustained recovery. If you look at past um, patterns of crisis, Usually, for the first few years after a deep financial crisis, almost all energy is devoted to trying to recreate what there was before, the status quo before the crash. That was certainly true after sort of, 1929. And it's only after a few years, when lots of things have been tried and failed, that actually the intellectual, the political, the economic space opens up for more fundamental solutions and more fundamental answers. In the 1930s, some of those answers were pretty malign ones uh, in much of the world. But in some countries, they were highly creative. Uh, in the book I recently published, I looked at quite a few of those examples, like Sweden, which in the mid-1930s put together a very different economic model, having had a very deep crisis, brought together business, trade unions, and others to sort of de debate the Salzjubaden uh, uh, agreement and establish the foundations for what then turned out to be many decades of very strong growth. New Zealand is another example which was probably the first you know, real Keynesian policy anywhere in the world in the mid-1930s and again reinvented not just its economic institutions but its social contract with the public, its welfare state as well as economic management and laid the foundations too for strong growth. The US is a much more messy story with the aspects of the New Deal having been creative responses to crisis, but in many ways it wasn't until the 40s that 
that uh, 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 the, the, the full scale reinvention of institutions and policies happened to lay the foundations for growth. The key point is that in response to those crises, well, that past crisis, governments and really their societies moved away from just trying to fix the problem as a technical problem, partly towards a more moral discussion of what the meaning of the crisis was, and then to a willingness to really reinvent almost all of their institutions in radical ways, far beyond the assumptions of the people who had been in charge when the crisis happened. I think now we are still much more in the position of the early 1930s than in that position of creative response. The political debate here, in the US, across Europe, is still essentially a backward-looking one, not looking forward to, uh, to alternatives. But if we are to look forward to alternatives, I think they have to address really the, the twin sides of the market economy, the twin sides of the causes of the crisis I've described. Now the first side of that is quite clearly reigning in predation in all its kinds. And a lot of what's happening in relation to finance is very much directed to doing that, making it harder to take unwarranted risks, uh, trying to stop the worst um, of bonuses and so on. Uh, the banking industry in this city is in the midst of a really fascinating debate about whether to become like a profession. If you are a banker and you knowingly sell a product which is against the interests of the customer, should you be struck off? In the next few months, I think... Uh, there will be agreement to move in that direction. It slightly makes you wonder how on earth that was not uh, in place in the past. But there's a sort of very basic, that basically that is attempting to embed into banking what we have in medicine with the Hippocratic Oath, a way of dealing with the asymmetries of power and knowledge between the provider and the consumer so that you, you stop exploitation being a, 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 a habit. And in the case, case of doctors, of course, your risk always is that the doctor will do things to you you don't need or will do you harm, hence the need for structures to, to stop that. We've got the same discussion in, uh, in banking. Obviously, a whole set of parallel issues about predation in relation to the environment and carbon and so on, which uh, others will have spoken uh, about in this, uh, in this series. For me, part of the, the key to understanding uh, our ways forward may lie also in something which I think will become apparent this autumn with a number of large companies in the UK beginning to talk about whether uh, as part of business life businesses should be held to account for the quality of what they sell and whether their products and services actually work or not. Now, this has become a very live debate in relation to governments. Should governments be evidence-based? Should evidence play any part in, in public policies or the work of teachers in schools, uh, police chiefs, and so on, which maybe we can talk about a bit later? What's fascinating is businesses beginning to ask, should they have the same principle? Should businesses commit as a matter of principle that they will only sell things if there is some evidence they work, they do what they say they're going to do? In some fields like pharmaceuticals, you sort of have to do that because to get a drug agreed by, say, the FDA in America, you have to go through clinical trials to see if it kills people or not. Um, surprisingly, that is not the pattern in almost any other sector. But this is part of, I think, business trying to prove to the public that its instincts are non-predatory. They are about service. They are about creativity. Now, the other side of the coin I'm going to talk about in a moment is the creative side and what we need to significantly amplify the creative capacity of the economy. But I want to give as, a, as an example of where these two sides, I, I think, are, are, are treated differently from here, the city of Sao Paulo. Is anyone in this room from Sao Paulo? Okay. Uh, Sao Paulo is an extraordinary city. Um, uh, absolutely booming, huge city, uh, uh, economic dynamo of one of the most dynamic economies in the world uh, today. And if you visit there, and I actually just came off a conference call from Sao Paulo just before coming over here, 
One of the things which strikes you fairly soon is there are no advertising billboards. And there are no advertising billboards because the mayor, Gilberto Kassab, a few years ago, banned them. And he banned them because he thought they were an example of the predatory aspect of the market, intruding into your consciousness whether you want it or not, and cluttering the city skyline, making it ugly and bombarding you in a way which is essentially predatory. Um, the other side of the coin, though, is Sao Paulo has this extraordinary rule, which I think was first set in the early 1960s, you may correct us, that 1% of all the city's revenues should go to the university. And because Sao Paulo is a booming city, that is a lot of money, and has made the University of Sao Paulo the best <coughs> in South America, funds business incubators of all kinds, a whole array of different activities. The point of the Sao Paulo example is, it's, is that both sides of the coin are very conscious social political choices to have a market economy, which is very dynamic, but to be able to choose which bits you want to have, uh, and on the other side to make choices about how much you invest in new ideas, new knowledge and new creativity. So I've said that there is strong evidence that in the, the boom years of the last decade, that there was in fact a squeeze on investment in new knowledge, new science, new innovation, quite surprisingly. To, to my mind, the key to getting out of this crisis, as indeed the crisis in the 1930s, is to achieve a step change in our society's capacities to create, to invent, to generate new knowledge. In the 1940s, that was often about ratcheting up secondary education, then growing universities, <laughs> The huge expansion of investment into science, particularly in the US, which followed Vannevar Bush's various plans in 1945. We need a comparable step change today to get us out of crisis, which will be partly about investing in R&D, universities, and so on, but also will involve very new methods of knowledge generation. And this is where I think there's a, both an opportunity but also a challenge for existing knowledge-based companies, universities, business schools, and so on, is how far to go with some of the new methods. And I'm just going to give five or six examples, which I think are, are live ones, of some of the innovations in the generation of new knowledge, which are still relatively small scale, but if we have anything comparable to the ambition of 60, 70 years ago, we need to become very, very mainstream. So one example is prizes, the use of inducement and challenge prizes as a way of tapping into new ideas from wherever they come. Britain pioneered this uh, notion of the prize as a generator of knowledge 300 years ago with the Longitude Prize. When Parliament gave £20,000 for anyone who could come up with a technology to measure longitude at sea. And if any of you have read the, the book on longitude will know that thousands of lives were being lost at that time because people were bumping into continents which they thought weren't going to be there and things like that. Uh, and famously it was won by um, uh, a, a, a very brilliant Yorkshireman who came up with a way of, uh, of measuring time. There will be a new longitude prize next year to mark the 300th anniversary and a new longitude committee has just been formed in the last couple of weeks. The point, though, is that these methods of using prizes are partly there to tap creative ideas wherever they come from. And some of the most interesting examples of prizes are quite surprising ones. Last year, the Intel Science Prize was won by a 15-year-old who had designed a, a test for pancreatic cancer, uh, much more efficient and reliable than anything coming out of the very big laboratories, and he had taught himself uh, largely on the internet, um, slightly shockingly for um, uh, much of that, uh, that field. There are um, websites like Kaggle, which sets um, informatics data challenges to a community of thousands of programmers around the world, and many of the winners of their competitions will be you know, people living in a remote place, not linked to a university, not linked to a company. The point about these open challenge prizes which offer awards for very objective measures of success is they in a way democratise the innovation process. They make it possible for anyone 
to win if the quality of their ideas is strong enough. A second example is the spread of accelerators. We at Nesta now help coordinate a, a network of business accelerators across Europe. Um, there's been a spread of them in the US, um, like Techstars and Y Combinator, and countries like Brazil and many others now have lots of these accelerators trying to be startup factories. And I think in this whole field of acceleration, again, is a, is a democratization of the business of creating new businesses and developing new technologies. It's a slightly different method from the traditional incubator, much more, in some ways, hothouse, much more structured, much more focused. But there's no reason why every university shouldn't have lots of them, why every town shouldn't have its own accelerators, why this, again, shouldn't become just part of the absolute mainstream of how an economy works. And I think some of the best accelerators link in large companies to the startup accelerators. So you get the startup much more quickly to its first contract with a big customer. The third example is, is digital making. Um, we've, we've started a program working with schools across the country, making it easier for children to code and program and create games. The basic idea being we need a next generation not just to be good at PowerPoint and Excel and Word, but actually good at programming, making the digital uh, world. And in a slightly odd event two weeks ago, we got George Osborne, the Chancellor, to do a bit of coding himself, helped by two 12-year-olds. Um, <laughs> the 12-year-olds were a little bit more adept than he was, but that's kind of uh, obvious. But again, and, and if you're interested, if any of you have children, do look at our Make Things, Do Stuff website, which will give a whole set of tools for children of pretty much any age to create their own animations, their own games, their own apps of all, all kinds. Again, this is a democratization of the work of innovation, one of whose outputs will be many more successful businesses, some from probably 11-year-olds' bedrooms. This, in a way, segues into the maker movement, the, the, the reinvention, the re-emergence of manufacturing as a mass activity, something which anyone can be uh, involved in. I don't think anyone knows where that will go. No one can really judge the true significance of 3D printers in all, all, all their, their forms. But it does look likely, again, that we're moving, if not away from the trend to much more centralized, robot, um, swarm-driven factories, to production and the business of making being re um, spread in the daily life of communities. Um, one of the um, projects I'm heavily involved in, had a good Philip actually today from the Chancellor, uh, which is Studio Schools. Um, Studio Schools were developed as an idea for really rethinking secondary education so that 80% of the curriculum for 14 to 19 year olds will be done through real life practical projects working mainly with business, mainly small businesses. And we came up with this idea partly out of the thought that this would be more motivating for a lot of teenagers than just sitting, like you all are now, in classrooms being talked at. And that the more you could make learning real, the more it could be real-life problem-solving with real-life businesses, and some of it paid, the more those 14, 15, 17-year-olds would be energized to learn. There will be 45 of these schools open by next year, they're spreading because it's turned out that they get dramatically better GCSE results as well as much better generic skills for creativity, entrepreneurship, team working, uh, and so on. And the Chancellor today in the Spending Review announced funding for another, another 20 schools the year after. One of the things I'm really keen on doing is getting universities and business schools linked up with studio schools because I think this is a again, a, a very interesting new model of working to link perhaps your 21-year-olds or 25-year-olds to the 15-year-olds and the companies who are setting them uh, projects. But maybe we can talk about that one later. And in much of this, I think there's a very interesting story of the movement of social innovation from being a rather marginal idea to being much more mainstream. And the, the global social innovation movement is really saying that the answers to the 
sort of the scale of the crisis we're still in are less likely to come from brilliant policy makers in Whitehall or Washington or wherever it may be. A lot of them will come from experimentation and entrepreneurship at the ground level. People generating new models of schooling, new models of university, welfare, healthcare, and so on, and developing them as practical pro projects. And only then will the policy makers sort of respond and reshape their policies to fit them. A sign of the times was two weeks ago as part of the G8 summit when David Cameron hosted a whole morning on social investment. London has become probably the capital of applying investment methods to social outcomes. We have Big Society Capital, which is the world's largest social investment bank, 600 million pounds. New asset classes like social impact bonds, which the UK ha has pioneered. And a whole plethora of new methods essentially linking business to social outcomes, finance to social outcomes, uh, all of which is still in a fertile um, evolution. No one quite knows where it will end. But it is a creative response, again, again to the, the depth of the crisis we're in. Now, I just want to end with, with a couple of, um, couple of points. One is really a question of a lot about how you think about the future of business really depends on what you think will be the biggest sectors of the economy in 10, 20, 30 years' time. And I assume all of you will have uh, your own answer to what will be the big sectors. There's a slightly different version of the question which asks, if you were twice as rich as you are now, what would you spend most of your extra money on? don't have to answer those now, um, but if you, if you look at almost any plausible forecast of sectoral size in the economy, I think you come to some quite interesting conclusions. Already in almost every country in the world, the biggest sector is health, and on almost every forecast, it is set to grow. In the US, it's 17% of GDP now, forecast by some to be 50% of GDP by the latter part of this century. That's probably an exaggeration, um, but the direction of travel is clear. Education almost certainly rising 7, 8, 9% of GDP. So too, though, are other industries like the creative sector. We did research earlier this year showing that in the UK, the creative economy is now 10% of gross value added, almost as much as manufacturing, a huge generator of wealth and creating jobs four times faster than the economy as a whole. Now, the reason that sectors like health and elder care, another field absolutely certain to grow, matter, is if you look at many of these uh, industries, it turns out that the key to their value propositions, their business models, is much less now the sale of products and commodities, uh, which tend to, to decline as a share of GDP, and much more value embedded in relationships. This is fairly obvious in relation to care. It's also true of any, any health pathway. And arguably, it's true in education, too. That if you simply turn your products into commodities, as MOOCs are doing, you will probably cannibalize your core uh, economic model and destroy it. Uh, and I mean, that's another that's a debate to be had. But the, the, the issue being grappled with in almost every sector is how do you actually develop business models focused on relational value and not just product or commodity value. And that, too, is almost certain to return us, in a way, to the importance of thinking about the non-predatory relationships and the social dimension of our, our, our economy. Just two final points. One is about growth. I think a lot of people assumed that the 21st century economy might be a zero-growth economy. And in a way, opinion polarised between traditional economics, which said, carry on with um, growth and perhaps don't mind too much about the costs to the environment or the family or anything else, and uh, a contrary view, which said we should almost, as a matter of principle, aspire to a steady state, zero growth economy as the only way to achieve sustainability and well-being. I take a very different view. 
If you look at the current economy, between 60 and 80% of all productivity growth comes from new knowledge and its application. And I think it's entirely plausible to imagine an economy in 10, 20, 30 years' time which is growing 3 4% a year, but where that growth is entirely made up of new knowledge and its application and implementation and coincides with declining inputs of matter and energy. And that in a way, the, the, the polarised debate of the 20th century was an essentially materialist growth, uh, debate about growth and not properly a debate about the nature of growth of knowledge. And the parallel I would give here is with all of you, with human beings. Most of you probably stopped growing physically quite a while ago, or at least you hope you did. <laughs> and in, in, in human development, we grow physically for a time, then generally stop. Uh, but we don't stop growing. We grow, hopefully, in terms of our minds, our wisdom, our experience. We grow in qualitative terms, but not in quantitative terms. And I think it's exactly how we should think about the economy. Moving from a period of predominantly physical growth, which was all about more and bigger and stuff, towards models of growth which are about again and better, about quality, about richness and depth. The final point comes from a, a, a story which I think in a way sums up the, the choices faced by many individual businesses, by entrepreneurs, but also, in a way, by our society at this sort of slightly strange juncture five years after the great financial crash of 2000, 2000, uh, 2007 and 8. And it's a story from Canada about a shaman uh, who meets a small boy. And the shaman says to the small boy, I, I contain within myself two bears. One bear is a vicious, cruel hunter, uh, and the other bear is a kind, compassionate, caring creature. And the boy is a bit troubled by this um, comment and asks the shaman, my God, which one will win? And the shaman replies, whichever one I feed. Whichever one I feed. And in almost everything I've talked about, these are matters of choice. They're choices for, as an individual, what personal route you take, what kind of business you want to create. If you're running a large multinational, you have to choose which you feed. If you're running a government, you have to choose which you feed. None of these are set by nature. They're entirely our choices. But the longer this slow crisis persists, perhaps the more important is we make those choices clear. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, um, thank you very much for that uh, splendid speech. Um, I think you've, uh, you, you've, you've come into a, an academic environment where we're, we're used to analysis um, and we have lots of uh, what my colleague referred to as two-handed economists who know way and the pros and cons of absolutely everything and coming to no particular conclusion. And you've given us this fantastic, um, uh, thrilling, sort of inspirational uh, perspectives for change and um, made it sound as if perhaps we really can, um, by the concrete steps that you've set out, um, escape from this uh, long drawn out recession. Um, and uh, you've uh, accompanied that by, put that in the context of what I thought was a very compelling uh, diagnosis of the problem, this, this rise of um, predatory behaviour um, and the uh, consequent uh, um, well, collapse of the reputability of uh, capitalism, capitalism becoming increasingly controversial. So I thought that was uh, that's fantastic. I hope it's I hope it's uh, I hope it's true. And, uh, <laughs> so do I. You're right. And I'm sure the um, it was very interesting to hear um, your, about um, Sao Paulo. Uh, I don't know if Boris Johnson will be uh, receptive to uh, <laughs> when the master of the college and others come along and suggest that he um, turns over 1% of the uh, revenue of the city of, of, of London to uh, education, but it's a splendid idea, and again, that would uh, be wonderful if, uh, if, if that would happen. 
Um, the, uh, it's, it's true, um, there have been so far very few uh, concrete suggestions uh, for action that seem likely to uh, bring this kind of crisis to an end. Um, and you refer back to the 30s, and one does think back to that, that period. And uh, I guess we've had five years now, so you might say, well, really, somebody ought to have come up with um, ideas as splendid as yours. Um, in the 30s, I guess it took Keynes seven year, um, six or seven years after the, um, after the Great Crash to come up with the general theory. So um, perhaps, perhaps now the time is ripe, and this will be offer us something. Um, anyway, thank you. Hopefully, we have a new Keynes in the audience here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I should. One, one tiny last thing, just, to, just a quickie, I should say, you're absolutely spot on about um, do we teach anything other than um, capitalist economics here? I don't, I don't think we do. Um, we used to, you're exactly right, we used to. Um, in 1972, when the economics department was set up, there was fantastic interest in um, com command economies and um, comparative economic systems. And when I first came here, the library still had an excellent collection of literature, of books, that have been uh, accumulated on, on comparative systems and alternative uh, modes of economic organization, which, alas, had by that time languished unread for several years. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was proposed to make space for more um, urgent and relevant material mm -hmm. in the library. I don't know whether we managed to come into it. But anyway, mm -hmm. there you go. There you go. So I so said once again, thank you very much for your excellent talk. We do have yeah. we do have a few minutes for questions. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry, it's quite yeah. yeah. waffling on too long. But uh, look, we have some some time for questions. And uh, if gentlemen there, blue shirt. Thank you very much for that talk. I thought it was really interesting, and I, I understand why you confidence seem to be. Well, with three comments. First of all, I think there's very strong evidence, and I've written quite a lot about this, that finance did have a serious crowding out effect, uh, in particular on talent. So it basically recruited huge quantities of the best talent in the Western world and took them out of productive activities into predatory ones. Certainly in the 2000s, that's been very well documented. You do need finance experts. You just don't need half your output of business schools and your best brains to be going into devising things like credit default swaps. And that clearly is a part of zero-sum game. That means they are not going into healthcare or engineering, all, the, all sorts of other things where they could be creating more value. And that's a, a, exactly a non, a, analogous to a big state bureaucracy sucking resources and talent I into I I itself. Um, in the case of pharmaceuticals, I think the pharma industry is in a, a, a sort of a really fascinating and challenging spot. It has, again, an enormous concentration of brain power and capacity and cleverness of all kinds, and yet on so many fronts, its models are clearly broken. They're broken in pure business terms, in terms of you know, future profit streams. They're broken in that so many of the new drugs, as you say, are slightly trivial in terms of, of effect. They're, tr they're, they're broken in terms of the fit between what they are doing and the health needs of the world population, again, uh, as you said. And Many people in that industry, I think, recognise it, recognise something fairly dramatic has to change or they will increasingly look like uh, a, a problem, not least because they draw in so much public money. Um, but uh, we still haven't seen, I think, enough leadership from the very top of any of the big pharma industries in articulating the alternative vision of how they could essentially use all of that brain power to actually make people healthier. <laughs> it's quite a simple idea. Uh, but um, not much sign of that. Can I just make one other comment on, on, on what, what you said, which is really sort of the, the intellectual challenge, which I, I only sort of, which I skated over. Um, I think you were probably right, when it was 30 years ago, to stop having lots of books on um, command economies on your, your shelves. But that's left us in this, this, this rather difficult intellectual position where economics... Uh, of all kinds, has very sophisticated ways of understanding change within economies and within markets. The rise of new firms or new technologies and new markets. But unless anyone corrects me, it has no intellectual methods or tools for understanding its own evolution as a system. How a market economy could evolve into something different. <coughs> there is, as far as I'm aware, no contemporary economic theorist who has seriously addressed that question 
which was a dominant question in the 19th century. How might capitalism evolve into something else? Uh, now, again, it may turn out most of those writings of the 19th century didn't turn out to be all that accurate, but it's left an extraordinary gap where the people who write about money and the economy and business simply lack any tools for thinking creatively about long-term dynamics. Uh, and I think there will be a big hunger for people who can do that. George Soros's INET project may be one of the places which generates a bit more sort of creative economic thinking, but um, it's too soon to say. Well, I wish I had a good answer to that. I'm sure someone in this room does. Uh, I do think if you look back over the last 150 years, many universities uh, were created with a mission which wasn't just a mission of teaching and training. It was often a, a sense of mission to change the world. That was true of the great German universities in the 19th century. It was true of this institution, true of the LSE, that they had a, a sense of moral purpose as well as, say, a, a technical knowledge generation and training one. And maybe we need to recapture some of that sense of the university as a place which isn't just, yeah, uh, which actually has a view of its role in the world. That then translates into certainly give your students lots of technical skills and everything from informatics to marketing to what have you, but linked to ethics, linked to a sense of, of service and vocation uh, and, uh, and mission, uh, technique, technique and, uh, uh, and ethics. But um, uh, I actually sat on a, a sort of panel of the um, business school's umbrella body a few months ago, uh, and to be absolutely frank, there wasn't much discussion there of what that broader mission should, uh, should be, even though... I'm sure here and in every business school I ever visit nowadays, a large proportion of students actually have a hunger to combine those technical skills with mission and purpose and meaning and want to learn about things like social entrepreneurship and social investment and the environment and so on in a way which simply wasn't the case a generation ago. So my hope is that demand actually from the students may be the key driver of change more than anything else, but who knows. Time for perhaps another question or two. Or maybe someone to violently disagree with me. The last <laughs> questioner said no one could disagree with me, and I'm sure that's not true. <laughs> Certainly not in a university. Or does anyone want to offer the, offer the vision of the future, the business school of the future? Well, it may be that uh, the, uh, the prospect of the lavish buffet. <laughs> <laughs> Which awaits us outside, as um, you said, to, to silence, notwithstanding. Uh, it's going to speak. So perhaps we should uh, thank our speaker very much. And uh, as I say, there is a lavish reception that can prepare this. <laughs> 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 <laughs>